Welcome everyone officially to our College of Staten Island Parent Orientation. So first I'd like to introduce a few people that are here that will be answering questions that will be presenting. So we have from the Center for Advising and Academic Success, Dina Grant Patelli. Hi, Dina. Hi, everyone. We have from the Office of Financial Aid, Michael Adamo. Good afternoon, everyone. We have from Dolphin Cove, CSI Student Housing, who will not be doing a formal presentation today, but will be here to answer all of your housing related questions. Dana Girasi. Hi, Dana. Hello, how are you guys? We also have from my office too, the Office of Recruitment and Admissions, Jesse Rodriguez. Hi, Jesse. Hey, everybody. And, and then there's me. So I do always like to mention that you will notice, oh, and, and don't, don't be alarmed. We have Sharon Christian, who's here from the Office of Financial Aid. So you may see somebody answering questions in the chat box. Don't be alarmed. That is not someone who's giving you misinformation. That is Sharon. She's an expert. She's the associate director there in financial aid. Hi, everybody. Yes. Hi, Sharon. Welcome. So I do always like to mention that you will see that a lot of us, most of us, everyone here in, that's at least mentioned, and I, I don't know, Sharon, are you an alum of the College of Staten Island? No. Okay. No. So I, so I think like I didn't say that. Okay. But you will see that everyone's listed up there. We all are graduates of the College of Staten Island, that including me. And there is me back in the fall of 1992 with, and that's my original, that's the original CSI College of Staten Island ID card. That's before we had these really fancy dolphin cards. That was my ID card back then. Look at me, there I was. So, and you will see all of us are alums. So not only do we work here and you know, obviously we have, we have a career and it's our job, but we also really love and really connect to the College of Staten Island. I know that's, that's definitely me. Um, I met my wife at the College of Staten Island. I've been affiliated with the college for many years and it really is a great place. And I think it's a great place for all of, all of your, your students. They, I think they've made the great decision. Obviously, welcome to the College of Staten Island. You're all dolphins now, whether it's just your, your students, but it's also you. You know, we're all transitioning. This is a big transition. I do like to touch briefly on transition. Not only is it a transition for the students, but it's also a transition for all of you. Your relationship is transitioning, right? You go from really, a, really their partner at, in high school to really just their mentor, right? So, so it's now time that the student really does take the lead. Um, they're going to face a lot of compl complicated academic and social issues in college, and you really are there to guide them, to mentor, to mentor them, but you have to sort of pull back a little bit, and that's sort of, you know, something we, we talk about, um, and, and we, we always mention, and by the way, um, my friend Jesse, she will be there putting in a lot of different links in the chat box as we're going along, so if you see some links, click on those now, later, but Remember, I will give you my email address. Anybody that wants the links that we mentioned here, you email me and I can send you those links um, very simply. So, you know, the first thing we always like to, 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 to really start about is, is FERPA, right? So, you know, unfortunately, you know, this is a good time for us to talk about how the student does take the, 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 the driver's seat. They're in control now. And you may say, yeah, but I'm, I'm paying the bill. They're living at my house. But you unfortunately cannot pick up the phone and really get um, your students information. You can't call up and say, are they going to school? How are their grades? Because they're now in charge of their education. And we, it is illegal for us to give you that information. Even if you are paying their bill, um, even if they are living in your home, they're in charge now. So now's a good time to have the conversation with what are they going to share with you? You know, you are living in my home. I am paying your tuition. I think you should share some things with me. But you can't call and get that information. If you would like us to share that information with you, you would really need to, to and, and Jesse's putting that stuff in. She's amazing. Um, there is a release form you can submit to the Office of the Registrar that would allow us to share any information with you if you did call. But really, they're in charge now. It's time for them to, to sort of manage what's going on. You're there to, to guide them, to assist them. To, to be their cheerleader, to, to give them a little nudge when they need it. You know, unlike in high school where there's somebody who would tell them to do your homework, make sure you're, you know you have your homework due to next week, you have a paper due tomorrow, make sure you read those chapters. No one's going to do that in college. They're expected to know what's expected of them. They're gonna get a, uh, what's called a syllabus. Each professor is gonna give them a syllabus, first day of classes, first week of classes. And on that syllabus, it's gonna list everything they need to do. And it's gonna be expected they know 
when papers are due, when readings are due. And you know, they could be on a class on, on a Tuesday. Um, and the next class is on a Thursday. And during that next, next class, the paper is due. Professor may not may or may not remind them the paper's due on Thursday. It's assumed that they know it's on the syllabus. So I have a conversation with them. Take a look at their syllabus. Say, hey, don't forget, you're in charge now. You're in the driver's seat. You need to be responsible for all of your own work. And as much as things do change, support systems do change, where you don't have that, that teacher, that, that guidance counselor, that principal on your case, the support systems get even a little better. There are so many great things that are now available to them as college students to help them succeed. And, and I, I always say it, Sharon and, and Jesse and Dina and Michael, um, Dana, we're all here. We're here and, and to help your child succeed. And there are countless other people at the college, whether it's the faculty, the great faculty that we do have, or our great staff, they are all here to help your child succeed. So there are so many services that are available to help them succeed, but no one's gonna make them go, go to the, you know, enjoy these services. No one's gonna make them use these services. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about a few of those services, and they're gonna get a full, a full lesson on what services are available to them when they go through our new student orientation program, which I'll talk about in a little while. But what are some of the services that I, I do want to highlight just a few that are really important and that you should really encourage them to, to take part in. Our counseling center, we have free quality ed counseling. You know, a lot of uh, healthcare coverage doesn't even cover mental health counseling. So it's, 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 it's great that they have access to quality counselors. Um, so they should, you know, whether it's group counseling, one-on-one -on -one counseling, and again, whether it's counseling, are they, are they struggling in some relationships in their life? Are they struggling academically? They should definitely take part in our counseling. It is free, it is quality, and it is there for them. And it's, again, another, another thing just to help them succeed at the college. We have a great health and wellness uh, you know, uh, office center. Again, right now, college is mostly closed. But when we are open again, there are nurses on staff, there's a nurse practitioner. Um, you know, we recommend making an appointment, but you even have walk-in service. And sometimes it's easier to get to, to see the nurse practitioner at the college and it is to see your own, you know, physician or physician's assistant in your, in your doctor's office. They also have a lot of great services to help with, you know, quitting, quitting smoking, uh, you know, issues with gambling and alcohol abuse, uh, safe sex practices, a lot of great resources at that health and wellness center. We have a great office of academic support. So that office offers free tutoring and it's peer tutoring. So you're, you're meeting with students who are, who have excelled in these, in these subjects, in these disciplines, and you can meet with these students for, free, again, free one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And you know, sometimes we think of tutoring in high school as a punishment assignment. Oh, I have to go see my, my teacher after school for tutoring. It's not like that in college. You should go see your tutor before there's an issue. What the tutoring is center is opening, open the first week of, of college. Go see the tutor, get a head start so you don't fall behind. And encourage, again, this is where you come in as the cheeler, encourage them to go the, see the counseling if you think they're struggling. Encourage them to go to academic support for that tutoring. Encourage them to go to the health and wellness center if they're experiencing any issues with smoking, with maybe alcohol abuse. Encourage them to, to go to these the different places. We have a great Office of Public Safety. We, we were voted uh, 2019, 2020 as one of the safest campus co college campuses in the country. So a great, safe, campus. I know all the parents are concerned about that. We have a great center for career and professional development. Obviously, we, what, why are they coming to college? Obviously, they're coming to grow emotionally, uh, academically, but they're also coming at some point to ultimately, to ultimately get a job. And we have a great uh, center for career and professional development to help you with writing your resume, with, you know, um, job prep preparation, professional imaging events like business etiquette lunches or dressing for career success, into job interview strategies, um, they do, you know, on-campus recruitment with many different companies and corporations. They have lots of networking events. They have interview coaching where you really sit with them and, and have a, a mock interview to help you when you're ready to start looking for, for a job. Um, they also do career exploration. You may say, I really love history, but what can I do with a career in history? And they have different surveys that you could take that will help you understand what you're best suited for with your strengths and your weaknesses. We also have a great student life. You know, there's so much to do. There's so much to get involved with. There's over 50 clubs, activities, um, student government. We have a radio station. We have a great study abroad program. There's so many things to get involved in. The more your student is involved, the better they'll do in college. And, and, and studies have shown students that are involved on their college campus will perform better um, in their studies. I know it sounds like it could be sort of 
counterintuitive, right? You're too involved. You're not doing well. No, but you have a, a you're, 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 you're really dedicated to your college and you really, really, really do well. So encourage them to get involved. You know, the, all the clubs that we have, there's over 50, many different, you know, depending wh whether they're religious clubs, you know, ethnic clubs, whether their clubs have to do with anything, you know, their, their career. And if a club doesn't exist, when I was a student back a million years ago, right, in the, in the, in the 90s, there was no drama club. We got together, at least ten, nine other students. We created a drama club. And I think the drama club exists till this day. So encourage them to get involved. It's really, really one of the most important things they could do, um, no matter where they go to college, but it's really, really important. So those are my, my, little, my little rant about getting involved. We're gonna do, and I'll, we'll talk about VNSO in, in a few minutes. And that's where they'll really learn all the students about all the, the different services that are available. So I, I know, and I see this question has already come in. You know, I, I always do want to, you know, talk about the elephant that's in the room, right? I don't want to ignore it. So, you know, we're still learning about what the fall will look like in the same real time that all of you are, frankly. Um, we're waiting for, obviously, guidance from, from, the, from Governor Cuomo. So, you know, as of, of right now, and, and there, there's a message from our chancellor, who, who the chancellor um, of CUNY, who put that out recently, thank you. Um, so as of right now, there should be, and I, I think Dina will address this again in a little while, and Dina, correct me if I'm wrong at all, please. We, we are working on now um, options for students who would like to participate in in-person activities who could take in-person classes in the fall. There will also, though, always be a remote option for everyone, um, whether, you know, so you, what your preference will be. So we're still working that through. I know the other question that really keeps on coming up, and I, and I know it's because Governor Cuomo mentioned not that long ago about mandatory vaccines. We're still waiting on guidance for that. I don't believe it could be mandatory until it, it becomes fully approved by the FDA, right? We're still in emergency use authorization only. I think we'd have to, the FDA would have to approve it um, fully, give it its a full approval before that could be mandated. Um, we should know more about that as things, as, as this all unfolds, but there, there should be an option for students who would like to take classes in person, and there should be an option for students who would still like to remain remote this fall. Um, so that, that's to sort of address that. I'm sure more questions that will generate some additional questions, and we'll sort of address those as we can as we go. So real quick, and, and this is going to lead me into our, our, our other pre presenters who are here waiting patiently have, have had enough of hearing me speak. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what the steps to enrollment are. A lot of you have already probably satisfied steps one, step two, and maybe even your child has even started step three. Um, that's as far as as you could could have gone. Yes, what, and, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about classes in the fall momentarily. I promise. I'm getting to that. I'm feeding to that right now. So your first step, obviously, is to is is to accept our offer of admission. The other thing I always like to talk about is CUNY's proficiency requirements. Right. I know some of you may have attended CUNY. I'm sure a lot of you did. Um, and you remember when you attended CUNY, there were CUNY assessment tests that you had to take to sort of place you and so you knew exactly where we knew to put you in classes, right? Well, we did away with the, with the CUNY assessment test, what we used to call uh, for short, the acronym CATS. The CATS are no longer gone. Now CUNY will assign students with, with their a proficiency index, okay? Um, the proficiency index lets us know whether that student is proficient in English and math or not. And based off that index is whether we require the students to take part in some kind of um, summer Im um, immersion program or what we call math start, right? So these are summer programs, remedial programs a student would have to take part in prior to starting classes in the fall. So if, if, if a student's proficiency index is a little bit low in, in either math or, or, or English, right? What I, what I showed before, um, sorry. Ahead there a little bit. Um, so there, so based on that proficiency index, it's right there, is whether or not we would require a student to take part in, in some kind of immersion or math start program. A student could have um, a really low score in both English and math, and then we could require them to go through what's called the uh, CUNY start program. 
CUNY START is a remedial program like immersion, like math start. The only difference is it takes place through the entire fall semester. And then students would then enroll in regular college credit bearing courses in the spring of 2022. Dean is gonna to touch more on how that affects what communication you receive as far as registration. And I'll let, I'm not gonna steal that, I'm gonna let her take that. So your first step is obviously to accept our offer um, and pay the commitment deposit. Most, a lot of people are waived from paying the commitment deposit. How are you waived? Your EFC, um, your expected family contribution is less than $3,000 or you had a CUNY fee waiver when you filled out the application and that fee waiver follows you. Um, so some students are required to pay, but you definitely accept your offer. Um, I'm sure a lot of students have done this already and it would either tell you here required or waived whether you have to pay that commitment deposit. So I'm sure a lot of people are past that step. If you're not, you still need help with this, this step, reach out to me, I can help you. Your next step is to submit your immunization records. We have been a little lax on, on really on that, on this rule lately because we've been remote, but it's in a, it's, it's a good habit. We're not going to hold you back from registering at this point if you don't have this form on file, but it's, it's, it's smart to get the form handed in because we will be back on campus ultimately, and that form will have to be on file. So make sure you get that handed in. Jesse put that in the link as well. So the next step we're going to talk about is CART, VCART, and I'm going to turn it all over to, to my colleague, Dina, and let her take over. Hi everyone, that's me when I was a student at CSI. Uh, my name is Dina Grant, it was Dina Grant then, now it's Dina Patelli. Um, I'm the advising manager for freshman and first year experience at CSI in the Center for Advising and Academic Success, it's a mouthful. Um, we shorten it by calling CAS. So you may hear um, you need to go see an advisor in CAS, that's our acronym for the Center for Advising and Academic Success. Um, basically, what we do in our department is we oversee um, degree requirements. So basically, we're like a student's GPS. Um, we help students stay on the path um, towards graduation. Sometimes they may go off and we're there to reroute them. For new students coming in, the onboarding process is a little bit different from the advisement that they will receive each semester moving forward. So each semester, a student will have an advisement hold placed on their account, and they will be required to meet one on one with an academic advisor. For the first semester, we actually go through the onboarding with the student, and we will register them on our account for them. Um, moving forward, they register on their own once they're advised. Um, so let me just explain, Sean, if you want to go to the next one. Um, we need your help here because um, we are sending a lot of emails about V card and VS, VNSO and commitment and it's going to their email. Um, so please remind your child to constantly check their email to see if their invitation is, is in there. Uh, just a note, if your child's using a Google, a Gmail account, there sometimes runs into a problem because our in our invitation goes into like a spam folder. So if you committed prior to today, I would suggest if you didn't get the invitation to uh, look in the spam folder. If you can't find it in the spam folder, just email me directly and I'll look and see where um, your child's at in the process. I'll put my email um, in the chat in a few minutes. Um, so when students come in, uh, they will be basically separated into two, well, actually three groups. Students that are considered fully proficient, meaning they have a passing, uh, a certain score on their English and their math. Um, then there are students that have remedial needs, as Sean spoke about. Those students are going to get an invitation to go speak to a representative in one of our pre-college programs, such as CUNY Start, Math Start, or Immersion. As of this morning, CUNY Start is, uh, Math Start is full for the summer. So all students that are required to take um, math intervention will be filtered to go through Immersion. Basically, immersion is intensive tutoring um, that students take for uh, a couple of weeks during the summer. And um, it's a very, very successful program. Once students complete the program, they usually go right into their college level math, depending on what their intended major is. Once a student um, gets that invite to go speak to a representative, they will then receive the CART invite. 
So the card invite is basically going to give you step-by-step -step on how to go through the process. So within CART, students will go through three modules, um, one on IT, one on advisement registration, and one on the um, paying for college. Once they complete those, they will fill out an intake form that we use to complete their individual advisement worksheet. In a few slides, I'll show you what that looks like. Um, so students will either get a, um, a, a direct invite to VCART or an invite to immersion and then the the um, direct invite to CART. And that the third group are those students who um, need CUNY start that Sean spoke about those students will not register for classes for the fall, they will only be registering for CUNY start. Okay, so let's see Sean the next slide. So when we were on campus a long time ago, um, we ran CART. It didn't have the V there. We were in person. We would enroll about 300 students each day during these sessions. Um, and during the sessions, they would learn all about our services. They would get um, information about their ID card. They would get to spend time with other students that are looking to major in their major. They would get to meet all of the advisement staff and then they would register for classes. So since we um, went virtual, we had to take all of those things and find a way to um, make students still have that experience. So what we did was we developed a virtual model, virtual uh, cart, um, where they do get to go through all of those different steps. So Sean, let's go to the next slide. Um, we're going to play a little video and it's going to explain a little bit better about each of the modules. Um, so please enjoy. Congratulations on being accepted into the College of Staten Island and welcome to your first step in your college career. Those students committed to CSI received a letter inviting them to virtual CART via Blackboard. On Blackboard, you can explore special programs, view vital information regarding registration for classes, and most importantly, completing virtual CART. Virtual CART consists of three modules, an information technology workshop, an advisement and registration workshop, and the various ways of paying for college. In order to move on to each module, students will be required to complete a short quiz regarding what they just learned. After all three modules are complete, students will file an intake form which will guide advisors to create an advisement worksheet that will assist the student with course registration, after which students will be eligible to complete registration. Once this is complete, you will be given the chance to meet your advisors from CAS, the Center for Advising and Academic Success, and view a postcard checklist. The postcard checklist has important reminders that keep you on track for your first semester at CSI. Thank you for taking the time to review this video. If you have any questions, please contact the Center for Advising and Academic Success. Okay, Sean, let's go to the next slide, please. So like the video explained, these are the three modules that um, they will go through. It's very, very informative. Um, there is a short quiz that we kind of measure what we want them to really understand going through those modules. And then they complete the intake form. The intake form is very, very important for us because this is the form that we're going to use to gain the information about your child. So it is ask questions about their intended major, if they have a minor, career goals, um, if they have any college now or AP credits. So I saw something in the chat about uh, English from St. John's. We do accept their English, but you have to get an official transcript sent over to us for the credits to be evaluated. If any of your children took college now within CUNY, we are able to access that right from our CUNY First system, and we can upload um, the equivalencies as we're doing their advisement sheet. So during the intake form, they will also let us know any schedule preferences that they would like, if there's any days or times that they're unable to attend classes on campus or on virtual uh, Blackboard. And then the advisor will, will go to the next step. So if we go to the next slide. Okay, so once that once they complete the VCART, they I will assign them to an advisor that I think they would work best with. Um, that advisor is responsible to complete an advisement worksheet, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. 
indicate blocks that they're eligible to take based on degree requirements, their course preference, their time preference, um, and anything related, you know, specifically for their degree. So there may be upper level courses that they're eligible to take for their degree that are not considered general ed. Um, general education at the college is what we call pathways. That's the general education throughout the university. So there's several different, we call them buckets that students must fulfill in order to complete their general ed. What's nice about pathways now is all of the requirements at CSI are also required at Brooklyn or Kingsborough or Hunter. So if students wanna transfer, which we're not encouraging, we want them to stay with us. Um, but if they want to, they can transfer over their, their gen ed requirements and it will satisfy the requirements at the other institution. Um, okay, so I just want to quickly talk about the blocks. Blocks are courses that are linked together based on um, meta majors. So meta majors could be um, social work, nursing, physical therapy, those all four ones of the meta major of um, health and human services. So we created blocks that students would be eligible to take. Right now, all of the blocks are online. There is not one course right now within the block that's in person. We are working day and night on trying to get in-person blocks. It's not an easy task since Classes have already been listed online since February, but we're trying very hard to make that happen. If your child's already registered for an online block and they wish to go in person, we will make that change for them. If you want to remain online, you can do that. So there will be flexibility in the scheduling. Um, just to quickly talk about how this online schedule looks, there are courses that we call synchronous courses what that means is those courses meet at a specific day and time online so for example you may be scheduled for an english 111 on mondays and wednesdays from 8 to 10. that means you need to be online from 8 to 10 on monday and wednesdays just like as if you were going in the classroom we also have courses that are asynchronous meaning there is no day and time attached. So basically the instructor posts the work for the week and you're responsible to submit all of the work um, by whatever deadline that is. So those are the two um, models right now that we have. Within those, there are some courses that are listed as hybrid. Hybrid means at some point during the semester, a student is required to meet in person. Um, and that could either be to take a test, to do tutoring, whatever the instructor assigns as the hybrid model. Those are the three we have right now. Like I said, we are working on the in-person. And um, as soon as we get official word and things are finalized, we will be contacting all of our students that we've already enrolled. We're going to give them priority over the blocks. And then as you go through, you'll have the option of in-person or online. Um, so your child will be sent these blocks, they will review them and de decide which block they would like best. The advisor will then go in, register them for those courses, email them a final schedule. And the last step that we do is we put a hold on students accounts, which prevents any registration on the students end. And the reason we do that is because we want to ensure students are taking the correct courses from day one. Um, towards their degree. We don't want students just taking courses because their sister took it or their boyfriend's in that class. We want to make sure they take the right courses. So putting that hold on for the first semester prevents any of that registration change. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, this um, image is three separate images. So the first image is um, a sample of what the advisement worksheet looks like. So it will have the pathway requirements. So if you see the first three um, general ed requirements are called the required common core. And then below that, there are six additional buckets that are the flexible common core. So based on your child's intended major and proficiency values, we're going to indicate on that sheet courses that they would be eligible to take. 
on the bottom of that are the blocks that we recommend. So for this student, we're recommending um, four blocks. What they're going to do is then look at those blocks in the schedule of classes, which is the middle image. This is basically going to give you the days and times that that block meets. And then at the end of the book, there is a course description for each course listed within the block. So if you wanted an idea of what accounting 114 entails, we have a, a, a description here at the end of the book. We encourage students to take 15 credits a semester. If we do the math, 15 in the fall and 15 in the spring is gonna give you 30 by the end of the year. 30 times four is 120. Um, if students can't do 15 because they work or they have other commitments, that's fine. There are other ways to pick up credits. Students can take classes during our intersessions, which is in January or in the summer. Or if they take 12 credits their first semester, they can take up to 18 their second semester. Um, so there, there are ways of getting back on track. Some students are not looking to graduate in four years. They uh, are looking to come part time. So basically, you do this on your own, you know, at, on your own pace. If you are eager to graduate, we will not stop you from registering for 18 credits a semester, and you will graduate early. Um, so your rate your you you do this on your own you know your own pace all right so the next slide oh i'm done okay so there's a lot of questions in the chat regarding um vcart so i see that some some of you have not received the invitation i'm going to put my email just email me directly your child's name and date of birth if you know their id number that's much more helpful. You could put that ID number in and I will see where they are in the process. Like I said, if they've committed by today, they should have received an invitation already, either to directly to VCART or to speak to someone in the pre-college program. Um, so if you didn't get that, just let me know and I'll look into it. Um, oh, someone said that they didn't have the um, VCART in their Blackboard. Um, same thing, just email me. Um, everyone that's been invited has been uploaded to um, Blackboard. So if you're not in there, it's possible that maybe you weren't invited yet, um, but I'll look into it for you. So just um, send me a quick email and we'll see where you're at. Thank you. Who's up? Oh, that's me. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, I'm back. So that brings us to new student orientation. So much. You know, much like what Dina said, we were an in-person event. The students would come in, we'd have a great day, and this is some pictures that, I'm, that I have up here from our new student orientation, and Jesse and I would, would work hard to make sure everybody was there and, and, and had their orientation. Obviously, since we went to COVID, we had to move virtual too. Uh, I, don't, I don't like doing that much work, so I just stole Dina's Dina's uh, way of doing things. No, I'm, I'm also using um, ITs. I'm also using Blackboard. It's it's a great way to seamlessly uh, onboard everyone. So they're used to doing their V card in Blackboard. So it's it should be very simple for them to then move over and do their new student orientation also via Blackboard. It is a Blackboard organization. Um, nobody should have received their invitation yet because I didn't send them out yet. We will start inviting students to new student orientation. Drum roll, please. One week from tomorrow, so June 3rd. June 3rd, we will start inviting our first group of students to participate. We're essentially going to invite everyone that's been invited already to, to, to VCART. So if you, so all the students, if you've received your VCART invitation, next Thursday, you should receive your VNSO orientation. Again, it is, it is and, and I'll use that fancy word, right, that, that Dina taught us, it's an asynchronous course in, it's not really a course, it's an asynchronous organization in Blackboard. Uh, so on under organizations, you'll see um, fall 2021 new student orientation, uh, virtual new student orientation, VNSO. Students will go in. It's asynchronous, so they'll they can start on June 3rd, and they don't really have to finish it until until August. We prefer they finish it as quickly as they can, so they get through it. But it is asynchronous. They could do a little bit each time, and I've I've tr we've tried to make it as simple as possible. It's really just it's all videos, right? So it's all videos. They watch some videos and there'll be a quiz. So there are eight chapters associated with versatile and new student orientation. Each chapter has a quiz. So you watch a video, 
take the quiz. We make sure that you've learned the information that we're giving you in that, in that said chapter and you move on to the next chapter. Again, I'm, it's really, some, I'm not trying to, you know, torture anyone there. The quizzes are not very difficult. It's just to make sure that they're, they're, they're learning the information. Um, and it's all information that, 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 that's vital to them to help them succeed. It's gonna talk about all the services that they have. There's gonna be a, a session on, on choosing the right major. Um, lots of great chapters. So make sure, and again, that's where I, I, I yield on, you know, we, we yield to you and say, please encourage them to check their emails, encourage them to do their V-card, encourage them to do their virtual new student orientation. They're all really important. Um, and aside from it being really important, new student orientation is a degree requirement. So students must complete the, the or they could have some issues registering for the spring. We also incorporate a live component. Each student is going to be assigned a new student mentor. It's a current student or, or recent graduate who is really familiar with the college um, and not, not as an administrator like us, but as a student. So a recent student, uh, current student or recent graduate who will be there to sort of guide them through their time during new student orientation. We'll also incorporate a live session. So once they complete that asynchronous course in Blackboard, they will also be required to meet with their, a group meeting with their, with their mentor. And we'll do a, a meeting much like this via Zoom. It's quick, 30, 45 minutes, just they get to meet some students that are coming in and they get to ask some questions of their, of their mentor. Um, especially after going through the, 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 the chapters in the module of, v, of VNSO, they may have some questions they'd like to ask and who better to ask than a current student or, or recent graduate. So make sure you encourage them to complete their orientation. Again, those emails will start going out next week. There'll be full directions on how to complete it, how to access it, but it'll be very similar to how they've already accessed VCard. It'll just be a different organization within their Blackboard account. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to your friend, my friend, everyone's friend, Michael Adamo, who's going to tell us a little about, about financing your education. Um, Michael. Good afternoon, everyone. So before I go into the financial aid aspect of it, I'm going to go over essentially the cost of being a student here at CSI. So on this slide here, you essentially see the tuition breakdown. Uh, if you are an in-state student, which is a New York State resident, or a non-resident, which means you are an out-of-state student. If you are a full-time student of CSI and you are an in-state resident, you'd be charged $3,465 per semester plus fees, which comes out to about $3,744.60. And if you're a non-resident, if you are full-time or part-time, it would be $620 per credit. There are many ways you can pay this balance, whether it be through financial aid or through signing up for a payment plan. So if you go to the next slide, there are ways, like I said, to pay for your education. One more slide, Sean. The main way that students pay for their education is through financial aid. What financial aid is, is funds provided to students and families to help pay for their post-secondary educational expenses, which is your cost of attendance. These could be based upon need or non-need basis, which I'll explain that in a little while. And financial aid does come from numerous sources, whether it be through the federal government, through the state government, or through private sources. So there are a few types of financial aid. The first type is what is called a grant. Grants are awarded to students based upon their eligibility when completing the FAFSA and TAP application. If you are entitled to receive a grant, there are no repayments of the grant. The second one is through a student loan, which is money that is borrowed by the student or parent that needs to be repaid at the conclusion of the student's academic career. Scholarships, which are no repayment is needed, and these could either be based upon need or by merit. And there is employment, which is through the federal work study program. What I would suggest is if a student has a federal work study award on their account, accept that award through their CUNY First account because what that entitles a student is it gives them the potential to receive a job opportunity on or off campus in which they would receive that funding and that award would go to the student directly which they can use for any expenses they may or may not have. So the beginning of the application process itself is you'd have to complete the FAFSA, which is the free application for student aid. This is to determine your federal Title IV eligibility, which is the Pell Grant or the federal direct loan. When completing the application itself, you are completing the 2021-2022 for the upcoming fall 2021 semester. They are available now. So if you haven't done so already, please complete them as soon as you can. And when you are completing the application itself, 
you would be using your 2019 tax information. Now, I understand with the pandemic that your income may have changed from 2019 to now. So when you are completing the application, you'd still use your 2019 tax information. However, once the application processes, which takes about five business days from the date that is submitted, you then can contact the financial aid office. We will send the email later in the chat and let us know that your income has changed between 2019 and now, and that you're requesting something that is called an income adjustment. And we'll be able to give you that paperwork uh, to adjust your income to what it is now, not what it was back in 2019. And our federal school code for the FAFSA is 002698, and our TAP school code is 1417. So the number that is derived from the FAFSA is what is called your expected family contribution. This essentially calculates how much a family is expected to pay for their students' uh, cost of tuition and how much they can reasonably pay towards the charges that are on their account. And this EFC, regardless of what college you attend, would stay the same. So if you attend CSI and then say two or three years down the road, you go to a different college, that EFC would be the same for each college. What students' cost of attendance exactly is, it's any direct costs that are on the student's tuition bill. So it would be their tuition, their fees. If the student is in Dolphin Cove, their cost of housing, as well as their meal plan. And any indirect costs would be costs such as textbook expenses, travel expenses, uh, regular expenses that a student would have to use to get to the college. And this is the cost of attendance, which is the figure that we use to see how much of a financial aid award a student can receive. When you complete the application itself, any school that is listed on the application would receive what is called the Institutional Student Information Report, which lets us know how much of an award a student is eligible to receive. When you complete the application itself, if you haven't done so already, you'll be able to list up to 10 colleges on the application. So as long as you list CSI as one of those 10 schools, you would be entitled to see your FAFSA, and then we'd be able to let you know what your eligibility would be. Approximately 30% of the students are selected for what is called verification, which means we would need additional documentation in order to process your financial aid, which we would need that documentation processed before we can distribute any federal financial aid award to a student. Here are a few grants that students are entitled to through their FAFSA. The first one is called a federal Pell Grant which the maximum award is $6,495 for the academic year, which is $3,100, well, $3,248.50 per semester. And this is based upon a student registering as a full-time status, which is at least 12 credits. A federal supplemental education opportunity grant is determined based upon the student's need and availability. The earlier you complete the FAFSA, the more likely you'd be entitled to receive that award. And a student would have to be registered for at least six credits to receive this. As I was saying before, for a federal work study grant, you have to be registered for at least six credits to receive this funding. And the earlier you complete the FAFSA, the more likely you'd get it as well, because it's based upon financial need and funding availability. Another option to get federal financial aid is through what is called a federal direct loan. There are two types of loans. The first one is a subsidized loan which is need-based, based upon the cost of attendance on your FAFSA. This is limited to your academic pursuit, which means we can only give a certain amount of a subsidized portion per each year. And a subsidized loan does not accrue interest as long as the student is in college, attending for at least six credits. The unsubsidized loan, which is not need-based, is a loan that would accrue interest to the day that is dispersed out to the student. Right now, there are no interest accrued on student loans and no payments through September 30th, 2021, because of the pandemic. That could change, but that seems like that's going to be the deadline for now. And the other one is a parent plus loan, which a parent would be able to take out a loan that would help pay for their students' expenses on their tuition. The way you can apply for a student loan is you have to complete a FAFSA first. The student would then have to complete what's called the Entrance Counseling and Master Promissory Note, which is on studentaid.gov. And then once those two steps are completed, and once we have the FAFSA on file, the student would then complete the direct loan application on our CSI financial aid website, or they can complete the direct loan processing form through their CUNY First account.
there are limits in which a student can receive a direct loan for their first academic year, which is a freshman, which is anywhere between zero and 29.9 credits. As a dependent student, they are eligible for $5,500, which breaks down to $2,750 per semester. If the student is an independent student, they receive $9,500 per academic year, which is $4,750 per semester. And regardless of if you're dependent or independent, up to $3,500 of that can be subsidized. And the current interest rate for the upcoming year is 3.73%. The next option for student aid is what is called a TAP award. These are for New York State residents who've been living in New York State for at least one consecutive calendar year. In order to receive this award, you'd have to be registered for at least 12 or more credits applied towards your major. So when you attend that CART session, the courses that you are given, make sure those courses are what the student is registering for, because based upon what their specific degree is, is the award that they need to get the courses for TAP. And the maximum award they can receive is $5,665, which is complemented by a CUNY TAP waiver up to the cost of the tuition. Here are a few scholarships that are offered through New York State. The first one and the main one is what is called the Excelsior Scholarship. That application became available starting on May 17th. So if you plan on applying for that, you'd be able to do so now at their website, which is hesk.ny.gov. In order to receive the Excelsior Scholarship, you'd have to have a household income of $125,000 or less from 2019, as well as you'd have to complete 12 credits towards your degree each semester and 30 credits per degree each academic year. The point of the program would be to complete college in four years, which is why there's 30 credits per year. So you complete the 120 credits at the end of your academic career. Another scholarship that is commonly applied for is a STEM scholarship, which is if a student is going towards a STEM field, and you have to be in the top 10% of their graduating class. If you are interested in that and you haven't done so already, again, you'd be able to apply for that through HESC's website as well. In order to maintain eligibility for financial aid, a student must attend the semester, whatever courses they are registered for, they would have to essentially go to in order to qualify for the aid that is on their account. If they do not attend the courses that they are registered for, this could potentially affect their enrollment status, which at that point would affect their financial aid. If you withdraw from a course, please contact the financial aid office before you do any withdrawals because withdrawing from financial aid may or may not impact a student's future financial aid eligibility. So I always urge students, if they have to drop a course for whatever reason, to contact us so we can review your eligibility and see how you would be impacted. And in order to meet the guidelines going forward, a student would have to have at least a 2.0 GPA and complete a certain amount of credits that they've attempted. And any guidelines for federal or state financial aid are available on our financial aid website. The way we communicate to students about their award eligibility is they get notified by email, letting them know what their estimated financial aid award is. If a student has to submit any documents to our office in order for us to process their award, they will be sent an email to their preferred email until they claim their CUNY First account. And once they claim their CUNY First account and receive their CSI email, any communication from the financial aid office would go towards that email at that point in time. You can also view your outstanding to-do list items on your CUNY First account, which I'll show in a little while. And you can also see what your cost of attendance is, any federal awards, Disbursement dates, the ability to accept or decline a federal work study award are all located on a student's CUNY first underneath the finances section of their self-service center. So on a student's self-service center, if you can see on the left-hand side, that would show their academics. But on the right-hand side, it would show what is called your to-do list, which your to-do list, if there are any items through the financial aid office, is telling you you have to submit in documentation before we can process that federal financial aid award. And if you look at the next page, you would only have to submit in the documents that show the institution is CSI. So for this student here, they submitted in documentation to Hunter as well, but just because you have outstanding checklist items at another institution, that would not impact your financial aid at CSI. So I tell students all the time, to, if you have documentation on to-do list, to submit them in as soon as possible, as it takes roughly three to four weeks for us to process your aid. 
which now you're looking at the end of June. So you'd want to have that done as soon as possible. And if you look at the next slide, if you click each checklist item, it does tell you what exactly has to be submitted to the office and where you can find the exact documentation that is needed. So if you see at the bottom, they do give you a link which you can copy and paste into any web browser and it'll provide you with this verification worksheet that is needed to be completed. Once you gather the documentation that would have to be submitted to our office, you can either submit it through a student's CUNY First account, which is through a secure portal. They do have a document upload feature now in which you can submit in documentation through CUNY First and it will be notified to the financial aid office so we can review the documentation and make sure what we need is there. You can also fax us the documentation, which will give you the fax number in a while, or you can email us the documentation as well. Once we receive the documentation, we review it. And if we have to make any necessary updates and changes, it would be sent to the Department of Education to review. Once this is completed, your financial aid offer may or may not change based upon what had to be updated on the documentation. And again, try to submit the documentation as soon as possible so it does not impact the student down the road with their registration. For more information, if you have any questions regarding financial aid in general, you can always visit our website, which is csi.cuny.edu backslash thin aid. You can also call us at 718-982-2030. Since we are working remotely, please leave a voicemail and we'll respond back to you as soon as you can. We typically respond back to voicemails within one business day. So at the end of the day, if you call around four o'clock, just be aware we might call you the next morning. You can also email us at financialaid.csi.cuny.edu. Again, again, same rule applies. We typically respond to emails within one business day. So just be on the lookout for that. You can also use the contact us link on our financial aid website. You can fax us at 646-664-3984. Or when we are back on campus for in-person services, you can visit Enrollment Services, which is in Building 2A, Room 106. Back to you, Sean. Thank you, Michael. Okay, so coming towards the end of sort of our steps to enrollment, last step, update your academic record. There's not much you really have to do there. Usually your school will send us your final transcript. If we do not receive a final transcript or we will, we will contact you. Um, but generally that is, that is done by your school, so worry not. Also, like, like somebody said before, um, I think it was Dina, if you did, you know, if you went to College Now, College Now is a CUNY program, right? So if you, if you took classes at College Now, Kingsboro, we have those, we have those classes in CUNY first. But if you took college courses at another school, you know, we usually use St. John's as an example. Um, a lot of students take those courses while they're in high school. Make sure you request that St. John's send us an official copy of that transcript or else we will not, it will not be on, you know, we'll, so we can update your academic record. Hence the slide we're on. So make sure you get that to us. If you have any questions, you can always email me or email admissions at csi.cuny.edu um, about that stuff. Um, it's, it's, it's a little blurry, I apologize. This is the academic calendar, but we're gonna put the real link in in a second. Jesse will do that. Um, first day of classes is, as you can see, or you can't see, because this is really blurry, is Wednesday, August 25th. So the first day of classes is coming up, make sure you click on the link that Jesse will put in and you'll see the academic calendar. There it is. And you could, you know, save that someplace, print it if you'd like, at least, you know, you know, days off and things like that. Classes should begin on that day. Um, we're going to take, we're going to really open up to really questions now. There we go. Just, but I, I, I you know, just wanted to mention that we do have, we are all over social media. I do mention, you know, our CSI new student programs, so, you know, subscribe to our, our channel. Um, I'll definitely put up videos there. Um, and that's where this will live eventually when I want to get it up there. Um, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're everywhere, everywhere. TikTok, Snapchat, we're everywhere. So follow us, like us, whatever you'd like to do. We also have a great, and this is not for you parents, so don't, don't try to join because we, we will not accept you, but we have a wonderful class of 2025 Facebook group. It's a closed Facebook group. We vet it. It is only incoming freshmen that are in that in that group. Encourage them to join. We definitely give updates there, but it's also a great place where they just meet each other um, and they and they get to communicate with each other um, and talk to each other about things that are going on. All right, we're going to open up the questions. It looks like we do have, as my question slide, 
We have a hand raised. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, call you out at all, but 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 you are a member of our esteemed faculty. Welcome oh, for, for being well, here thank today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm professor at the college. I'm representing here today my cousin. He's joining from Georgia, and I have two questions on his behalf. So my first question is when student can get academic advice, when he can register and pay the tuition. That's my first question. And my second question is when, how student can get uh, health insurance. Thank you. No, you're very welcome. Thank, thank you for being here. So I'm going to let Dina take that first one, I guess. Right? It's, it's incoming freshman, correct? Yes. Okay. He's an incoming freshman. Yes. Okay. Once he's invited to VCAR and he completes the modules and the intake form, he he'll, he'll be assigned to an advisor, usually within 24 to 48 hours, and then that advisor will work directly with the student to complete advisement and registration, and then pay the bill, of course. Um, I have students registering now. I believe the bill is due um, July 13th, so you have a little time. Um, but you have to make sure you pay the bill. Um, if not, they can deregister your classes. And thank no, thank you. And Jesse put up the link for health insurance information. That would be through the Health and Wellness Center. So click on that link. Their information is there. Contact them. They are great. And they should be able to help uh, the student with, with health insurance. Um, okay. So I'm going to definitely, I want to start going through the chat box. I know there are some questions we did address there's some that we missed and I'm going to just I'm going to go through real fast um so how do they evaluate they so students are evaluated um so for the for the that index right the English and math index um proficiency index it's really they look at your overall grade point average they look at region scores for those New York State residents um and that's how they evaluate what the proficiency index is I will tell you this and this is something I even learned a little bit this week um, so for New York State residents, really, um, math is definitely very heavy looking at the regents and less on the overall classes where English is very, looks at the regents if you're a New York State resident, but is also a little very heavy on, a little more heavy on, on the actual courses you took and the grades you received. Um, you could, you could, yeah, uh, Jesse put in the link there to have, to, to, that explains more about the proficiency index. Um, there's no reason to know the index score. I don't think it's not as important. If you're interested, I could give you that score, but it's it's more that that score tells us really what what your next step is. Is it is it the is it fully remedial and you go right onto regular courses? Is it you need an immersion program or math start before classes start to just bring your bring you up to speed, or is it maybe your your skills uh, need a little more work and maybe you go through that CUNY Start program? And that's what that index tells us. It tells us where we place the student and place them accordingly. So they're successful. I don't want you to think, oh, my, 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 my student has to go to the summer program. Um, think of it as a good thing. You really do need to be proficient in math and English to succeed in just about every course. So even if you're taking, you know, I, 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 my degrees in cinema studies, right? I, have, I took a lot of um, critical, critical uh, cinema courses where you watch films and, and write papers, you really do need to be proficient in, in English to take a, a cinema course, right? You need to be proficient in math to take a business course, to take science courses. So it's really, really important that you're proficient and we evaluate that proficiency level and then place you accordingly into in a remedial, remedial course if necessary. So don't think of it as a punishment, think of it as a good thing. Um, the, the remedial courses are generally either free as in immersion or very low cost as in CUNY Start or Math Start. So you're, you're not spending what's really about $1,000 on a college course, a three credit college course could cost you about, about $1,000. You're for $35 maybe, you're, you're getting to work on those remedial needs and not using your financial aid and, and not you know going out of pocket for, for, for remedial courses. So just think that, think of it that way, think of it as a benefit, think of it as, as a good thing. So Dina did mention about all those, about the Blackboard, email her email me we could see you know i answered all of those already good, good yeah i thought you did and you know students and i will say this and i i know this from my experience with vnso sometimes students are getting the email they're actually and i hate to say it they're actually opening the emails and then saying i never got the email and we could track that they actually received it opened it 
clicked on some things in the email and then we'll say they didn't receive it. So I think sometimes uh, they're, they're, not, they're, they're not paying attention to everything. They're opening, so just be on, you know, be on them. Let them know that these emails are coming in. Um, Sean, I'm, I'm getting a lot of questions regarding the registration process. Please take it away as I look, I feed through this. Again. Quickly go, review go. the process for students. So students are going to go through VCART. Those are those three modules. They'll complete the quizzes at the end of each module, and then they are required to complete the intake form. Like a, uh, the intake form is going to ask general questions about intended major, careers, things like that. I then will take that information and send it to one of our academic advisors who will then work directly with that student one on one. They will send them an individualized advisement worksheet and blocks that we suggest that they enroll in based on you know, all of the information that we've collected. Um, our turnaround time is about 24 to 48 hours. So once the advisor originally gets the list, figure about another 24 to 48 hours, we send the email back, your student responds with their block um, request, and then it's about another 24 to 48 hours for us to enroll. Um, so we're, we're doing onboarding right now for all incoming students, that's including transfer students and readmits. And, you know, we're also responsible for 4,000 undergraduates. So uh, we're very busy. I wish we can, you know, get the turnaround time a few hours, but um, we're working as fast as we can. If it's any longer than that, just please contact me so I can see um, what's going on. And I know Dina addressed this before. So students who are in Macaulay Honors, Verrazano, Teachers Education Academy, ASAP and SEEK, do not go through VCART. They are advised through those programs. Each program has their own advisor for those programs. The same is said for VNSO. Students in those programs, except for SEEK, are not required to go through VNSO. They have their own orientation programs. SEEK students are required to, to participate and complete VNSO. All right, I have two financial aid questions. Whoever wants to take those, I'll give them both to you and you can take them one at a time. I have a 529 fund for my daughter. How do I use it to pay for college? And a related question, how does my child, um, does my child have to have a bank account to claim their rewards that came with financial aid? So to answer the first question with the 529 account, I would have them contact the Bursar's office, uh, which you can contact them at bursar at csi.cuny.edu. I'll put it in the chat only because that's not necessarily a financial aid award. That's more of a fund to help pay students college balance. If you contact them, hold on one second. I'll just message it to someone directly. If you contact them, they will be able to let you know exactly how to have that balance paid to the college. One second. And if the student is already registered for courses, you can contact them today, tomorrow, at your earliest convenience to let them know how to go about that. If you haven't already, as soon as a student registers, I would suggest you contact them because it may take a few days for to process an update on the student's account. Uh, regarding the second question, they don't necessarily have to have any bank information uh, in order to receive or process any financial aid. The only thing that we would potentially need from your bank account is a, on the FAFSA, it's going to ask if a student has any cash savings or checking account. The student obviously doesn't have a bank account. They put zero for that figure. Or if the student does receive enough financial aid to fully cover their tuition balance, they could receive a refund through direct deposit. But if they're not signed up for a direct deposit, they would just receive a check in the mail. All right, so there are a bunch of questions about, I guess, uh, FAFSA rewards. Some people haven't received. And I think, uh, Sharon, you did put that in there to email. Uh, financial aid at csi.cuny.edu. The students sometimes called EMPL ID number, sometimes called CUNY first ID number, sometimes called CUNY ID number. Though those are all the same number. It's, it's your ID number at CUNY. So email uh, financial aid, and then they can check each individual person's uh, financial aid award and let them know if whether they received it or not. I guess some people who might not have received the award because Michael, and correct me if I'm wrong again. On the, in their to-do list, there could be some things they still haven't submitted, right? There's things they need to submit, and that's why they wouldn't have received the award. Correct. They, they would still receive a financial aid award letter, but they would also receive an email letting them know that they have to submit in the documentation for us to process their application. Like Sharon said, email us uh, the student's name and the employee ID, and we'll look into the account. 
because they may have received a financial aid award letter, but again, it would have went to their preferred email if they didn't have access to their CUNY first yet, or there could be some issue that's preventing us from providing them with that award letter. Great, I college have a question. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you, if I can question, sure, sure, yeah. I, I fill up FAPS application. I didn't receive any email or nothing from them. And at the same time, I fill up the application for the TAP financial aid from New York State. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't receive any email, like because my friend said that I have to do an exam or something like that. What do I have okay. to do? Which is the next step? That exam might be if, uh, what it's called an ATB exam, which is if you graduated from a foreign high school outside of the United States, you would have to essentially pass that in order to receive a TAP award. Um, that wouldn't prevent you from getting an email regarding your Pell through FAFSA, though. Um, so if you can, please just send us an email so we can look at your account in detail. Since I answer the emails, I'll probably be looking at the email later on today or tomorrow. Um, and I can just let you know if you have to submit any documentation or if there's something else that's preventing the award from dispersing out to you. Please, can you put your email in the in the chat so I can email you right now everything, all of my information? Thank you. Great, do College Now credits transfer from my high school? Yeah, College Now co credits are CUNY credits. So they're in your account, they're in the student's account already. They're there on his, rec on his or her records. So it's on their record. So yeah, we, we have those. Um, and I believe Dina, you take that into account when you're, when you're advising them, right? They're college now credits. Yes. And when I say college now, I mean a college now program through CUNY. There are people who take other college courses that are not part of college now while they're in high school. Sometimes that could be a little confused. People think sometimes courses at other colleges, college now, college now is specifically CUNY college, right? Usually it's Kingsborough. A lot of the students on Staten Island go through Kingsborough. Those are on your account. We don't need those. We have those. We have access to those. It's the other colleges you might have taken courses at. Will we be able to visit campus? Yes. Email me. We are doing uh, uh, small campus tours again. Email me and I will forward that to my colleague who's handling those campus tours and they will, someone will reach out to you. Um, just email me um, some, you know, how many people are in your party. Um, so send me an email that you're interested in, in a campus tour, um, you know, email address, telephone number, uh, student's ID number, student's name, and just how many people would like to come. We'd like to keep it limited. So try not to make it more than three or four people um, due to COVID restrictions still, we're still working through those, but we can offer some campus tours and we'll work with you according to a, a schedule that works. So, okay. So Dana, you're here and, 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 and I'm gonna turn it over to you for a second. Anything you'd like to say? And the question is, you know, how do I pay for my dorms? One, we don't ever call it a dorm, right, Dana? It's, it's, it's luxury <laughs> apartment style housing, uh, on-campus housing. But I turn it over to you, Dana, if you'd like to you know, okay. add anything to like, that. I did see that question. Um, I realized you did not apply for housing, so I don't know if anyone knows, but housing is separate from CSI, meaning you have to apply separately to housing in order to live on campus. So um, we are, um, Doc and Cole, we're CSI student housing, but we're part of a management company called American Campus Communities. Um, so we basically were brought in um, from CSI and the campus uh, residence halls are right on campus. You could get closer to campus if you tried. Um, but there is a process um, for housing. So you have to apply with a $400 non-refundable fee. Um, that $400 does turn into a damage deposit um, upon um, moving into housing. So um, it kind of works as a security deposit like it would in an apartment, it's the same concept. Um, so once you apply, um, we do get your application via email and then you would um, need a guarantor to co-sign on your license agreement. So that is anyone that's 18 or over. Um, that has employment, um, so you cannot be your own guarantor. You do need somebody else to sign it. Um, but your housing charge does go on your bursar bill, so your um, guarantor won't be like financially responsible for it. We just need someone to um, co-sign it. So everyone needs to sign a license agreement. That is the next step. Um, once you sign your license agreement, um, you can be accommodated to a space or securing your space. If we have space available, we currently do have space available. Um, I do have some bit of news. We're going to be full capacity again next year, which is great. Um, last year, we were limited capacity. So we are back to our 440 students on campus, um, which is a great thing because last year was very limited. Um, but um, it is not a must to say on campus. You have the choice to. Um, if you are commuting from a far place, we always recommend it because it's so much easier. You're not, you know, 
commuting back and forth. Um, if you're from like the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, it could be a three hour commute. Um, if you're staying on campus, your commute's like 10 minutes if that. Um, so once you um, apply, sign all that stuff, you're invoiced. Um, so students have an invoice with their aid already factored in. We work with a financial aid coordinator named Melissa um, that only works for um, Dauphin Cove um, as well as a financial aid office, but she's primarily just for Dauphin Cove. Um, so we get the aid numbers um, to us and our bookkeeper, David, he does process invoices based on those aid numbers. The way financial aid works for us, um, it has to go towards tuition first. If there is any money left over once tuition is covered, it can go towards housing. So not everyone um, kind of gets their housing covered by aid, but it's not impossible. It kind of depends on how much you're getting for financial aid. Um, you do have to have a meal plan to live on campus for two consecutive semesters. Um, so if you live in here fall 2021, it will be fall 2021, spring 2022. And then after the two semesters, you're not required to have one, um, but that is a requirement. Um, so there is no deadline to apply for housing. It is first come first serve. It's always better to get your application in earlier rather than later, just because July 1st is the payment due date for housing. And that is less than two months away. Um, it's about a month away now. So you wanna make sure you get everything in and everything sorted out um, prior to that. If you have not done your FAFSA or anything like that, make sure you do that because that is very important because um, your invoice will probably be uh, the full payment for um, for us if there is no financial aid applied. Um, you can also take out loans to pay for housing. That is an option. You can enroll in the payment plan um, that is offered through the school with NowNet. So that is an option as well. Um, we do offer uh, various types of units. Um, I'm gonna put our website in the chat and you can look at the units and the prices. Um, it's a little bit easier to visually see it. Um, and if you would like a tour of housing, we can do a virtual tour. Um, if on our website, we have actually a sign up for the virtual tour. We have a um, open house housing thing for um, a couple of dates in June and July that you can sign up for as well. And then if you're doing the campus tour, you can request to see housing along on that campus tour and we can schedule that with um, uh, admissions and stuff. So that's pretty much it for housing. Um, is there a chance? Sorry, I'm reading questions. No, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Any, any, we'll see. I'm sure maybe more questions will come in. And yeah, yeah. generally, we do stop at housing for the tours that we do. Usually, if students are interested, I know they'll ask. Usually, my colleague will ask that and arrange that. I have a question, and it's from Michael. Yes. Um, when can we hear back about the um, income adjustment? You mentioned something about income adjustment because we submitted our information based on 2019 tax return. Mm -hmm. And um, since there was a drastic decrease in 2020, mm -hmm. um, how soon can we hear back about that um, adjustment form? So if you already submitted in the documentation into our office, I know we began processing them uh, within the past week. Typically it takes about three to four weeks for the documentation to be reviewed by the appeal committee and for the update to be made onto the student's CUNY FIRST account. If you already submitted in the documentation, it's probably being reviewed by the counselor that it was assigned to. If you don't mind me asking, have you heard back from anyone at this point in time or not yet? Uh, whether or not we're eligible? No, uh, from the financial aid counselor if you submitted in the documentation. We submit and all I know is that we're not eligible. Okay, um, if you want, just send an email to the financial aid office just so I can review your account. Um, and see what was submitted into our office and just let you know if there's anything else we can do from here. And so the student will be notified to their CUNY First account. Well, the student would get emailed um, their eligibility if they're either eligible. Yes, or not. yes. After you after I write to you, um, then you that's where we will get notified. Correct. Okay. And then one last question. The payment that the first payment that's due on July 13, what is that going towards? Is that for tuition? Is what is that exactly for? So if that's the full balance that's on a student's account, which like I said before, probably $3,744.60. Mm -hmm. That would be the tuition and fees for the fall 2021 semester. For the whole semester. Yes. So that's that three that three K is for one semester, correct? Yes. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. No problem. I'm going through the questions. Uh, question. Yes. Yes. How how long are the semesters? So I mean, there's two you know main semesters, right? You have the fall and the spring, and the fall semester runs from 
August 25th till mid-December. Um, and then there's a little break. We do have a shortened January session, which usually gets pretty limited, goes about three weeks. Then the spring semester starts at the end of January. That goes until um, we're just about ending now, right? We're ending the semester now. So it goes till about mid, mid to late May. Um, and then we have a couple of summer sessions. Um, they, you know, there's a couple of different sessions in the summer that run, you know, the month of June, and then we have some that go from June to July, and then we have a second session. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Uh, Sean, can I just jump in about something? Yeah, of course. Um, for student housing, typically what happens is if you apply for financial aid, which like I said before, is through Pell and through TAP, that would always have to go to cover your tuition balance first. Um, and then whatever is left over, that would potentially go towards covering the cost of housing if there is an excess financial aid award. Your financial aid alone through Pell and through TAP would not be enough to fully cover the tuition balance for the student. So anything else after the fact will either have to be paid to housing through, like Dana said, the payment plan or applying for a student loan or, you know, things to that extent. If a student does not receive financial aid through Pell and through TAP, and they apply for a loan, that loan would specifically go towards their tuition and fees that are on their account. And then the rest would obviously have to be paid towards housing, whether that be through a payment plan or just paying the entire balance at once. Oh, we have a hand raised, uh, Tony Acosta. I don't, my daughter is, uh, we're from California, Los Angeles. Um, earlier you guys said uh, about uh, in-state tuition. Yes. Um, you know, we filed obviously for the fast. Uh, after the after a year of her being in New York, can she apply for a tap? So, if she would be applying as a dependent student, it would also depend upon the residency of their parents. So, if you've been living in New York State for a calendar year as well, then yes, she can apply for tap. But if she is applying as a dependent student and you live outside of New York State, so if you still live in California. She wouldn't be eligible for TAP because the parents also would have to reside in New York State for a calendar year. Okay. We yeah. have a, oh, I'm sorry, do you have another question? Yes, yes. Um, and then as far as like um, like the academic financial aid and whatnot, when does that come out? Because my, uh, my daughter is going out there on a sports scholarship. So we're waiting for, you know, the rest of, you know, mm -hmm. Not to come out. So we're still um, if she if she's uh, in athletics, has she heard back from the athletic department regarding any scholarships or no? Yes, uh, the academic of it, the academic. Okay, because typically I know with the athletic scholarships, they would essentially have to fill out a form, and then once they fill out that form between the student and the athletic department, that would get forwarded to the financial aid office for us to complete our end and post the award into the account. Yeah. So if you already filled that out, I'm sure it's just a timing issue at this point. And, you know, it just has to be updated on the account. But if you have filled out and have completed that process yet, we would then post the award as soon as we can and we notify the uh, bursar of the award that the student is eligible to receive. Okay, because I know because I know there's something on her on her student account now, but mm -hmm. I just you know obviously the July 13th plan. I want um, to if you want, sir, you could message me directly and I'll just take a look at her account as long as you give me the ample ID. Okay. What sport is she playing? Uh, softball. Oh, great. Excellent. All right. Um, I believe the next hand that went up, uh, Mercedes. Hi. Uh, thank you. I wanted to know with the Excelsior scholarship, um, can this be used for, for everything too? The, the tuition, the um, room and board? So the Excelsior scholarship, it, it's somewhat misleading because it's only towards a student's tuition award. It's not, you know, college is free and that's it. If a student has enough financial aid to fully cover their tuition balance through Pell and through TAP, they wouldn't receive the Excelsior scholarship because that is a tuition only scholarship. What I tell students all the time is if you are eligible for the Excelsior scholarship, still meet the criteria of the 12 credits each academic semester and 30 credits each academic year because in the event something happens in the future where your household income has gone up and you're no longer eligible for a Pell or TAP award to fully cover the tuition balance, you then can still use the scholarship to cover that remaining balance if there is a remaining balance at that point. So 
Um, so I'm thinking, I'm not certain because this is for my brother um, and my, for my nephew. I'm thinking they may not be eligible for uh, TAP or Pell. I'm not certain because I don't know the requirements. So, um, so you're saying if, if TAP and Pell can be used towards uh, room and board. If they receive enough to fully cover the tuition balance, whatever the excess is, that would go towards housing. But like I said before, it's not, it's never enough between Pell and TAP to cover a student's tuition and housing charges. Got it. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, as I'm going through the questions, we have another hand raised. Uh, Miriam? Yeah, good afternoon. Um, my question is that, um, what about if you have already submitted every your document online? Did I, do we need to send another document to you guys again? So if you have already submitted the documentation, what I would suggest is to check a student's to-do list on their CUNY First account, because anything else that we need would be on that to-do list. If there's nothing that is updated on the to-do list and everything is either marked received or those checklist items are removed completely, that means we received everything and we do not need any additional information at that point in time. We're just waiting for the application to be updated by FAFSA and for it to be returned to us so it can be completed. If there is an additional checklist item on the to-do list, then we would need that documentation to be submitted before we are able to update the account in order to finalize the application. All right, thank you. You're welcome. I think I've gotten through, I think we've answered, if, if we didn't answer your question in a chat, maybe throw it in again or, or just raise your hand and ask it or just, you know. Um, so I think we've gotten through all the questions. I, I feel like I'm starting to answer questions that, that were already answered in the chat. So I don't want to become redundant. I don't want to keep, I know I'm always cognizant of time. Session is, is coming on, on an hour and a half. I don't like to keep people too long. Um, so I'm going to say last call for questions if we haven't answered your questions. I know I think I got some questions ahead of time. I think they were all answered. Um, it looks like I have I think, a question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I don't I can't see if it was answered or not. Um, Go ahead. My son is going to be getting uh, money from the GI Bill. So now I, I know it, it takes a process and my husband already, you know, did all his his paperwork. But if it's not ready by the 13th of July, like, how does that work? Do we have to pay and then work it out with, you know, whoever gave us the money? So what I tell students and parents, if, if they're getting funding from an outside source, so to speak, let the financial aid office and the bursar's office know this, because what we can always do is we can always put an indicator on the student's account. So they don't have to pay the tuition balance until the documentation that they need to receive and submit it into our office for it okay. to be processed at that point in time. And who would I send a message to the financial so, aid office? Yes, you can email the financial aid office as well as the bursar's office. And again, I'm putting their chat in the uh, email, in the chat okay. box, I mean. Okay. Um, so you can email the financial aid office and the bursar's office. And just like I said, let us know uh, you're potentially receiving a GI bill for the fall 2021 semester. However, you're not sure when it's going to be submitted to you. So for you to submit it to the financial aid office and bursar's office. And then we'll just look at your account at that point in time and see if uh, we can put that indicator so you don't have to make. Okay, thank you. And, and have you been in touch with our veterans I, office? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. I, I have a question. Yes, please. Um, okay, I, I put it in the chat, but I'm, I just, I know that they have to do the financial counseling and do everything online for the federal loan at studentaid.gov. But what do they have to do for the school to get the loan, like for the loan to go through? So if you already completed the entrance counseling and master promissory note, that's the only thing you have to do on the federal end of it. If your student has already attended a court session, they would be able to use their slash information and complete that direct loan processing form through his CSI website. Um, Give me one second. I'll put the link to that application. I just placed um, it in the chat. Okay. Thank you, Sharon. Okay. Thank so as you. long as a student has a completed application, completed FAFSA, and completes those two steps and is registered for CART and completed it, 
he then can apply for a link through that way. If he hasn't completed CART yet, he wouldn't have his SLAS information. The only other way he can complete a loan at this point in time is if he would complete the direct loan processing form through his CUNY First account underneath the student center. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. A lot of great questions today. Yeah, go ahead. One, one quick one. So if a child is 18, what's all the summer and saved money at? When they calculate in the financial aid, I know that they use um, parents' income. Well, if the child is 18, will they use the child's income, their bank account? Is that considered when they're making the financial aid decisions? So when you are completing the application, you would have to provide the students income information as well. Um, so like say a student has like an SYEP job, because I know a lot of students do that over the summer. You would report, you know, the $1,500, $2,000 that they would have earned in that summer in 2019 while okay. completing the application. Most of the times, if a student does have the bank account, you would be able to report that information as well underneath their cash checking savings account on the FAFSA, as well as report the parents' information as well. But again, if, if the student only had like a summer job with a few hundred to a thousand dollars, it wouldn't impact the eligibility that much. Um, it, it mainly look at whatever the parent would report on the application. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, I'm still questions. This is great. A lot of great questions today. It seems like a lot of financial aid questions. Any more questions for regarding CART or interested in orientation? I have housing. a question. Yes. I have a question. Please. Hello. Proceed. Yes, definitely. Okay. Yeah. So until, <laughs> until we receive something from financial aid stating what is our contribution, we are, we don't pay for anything yet. Because I didn't oh. hear anything back from um, either mm -hmm. the FASA or TAC. So what I would suggest is um, have the student check their email uh, and just type in financial aid. I, and search I just keep telling her, check all your emails. It's like, I, I, I feel like it would have been much easier if everything was just sent to the parents. But she, <laughs> if anything, it's like pulling teeth with my fingers. If anything, you could check the student's uh, CUNY First account. There is a section on the student center that is called a view financial aid section. Okay. If you click on that, you could see any financial aid the student was awarded during the 2022 academic year, which is the 2021 fall semester, and 2022 okay. spring semester. If they do have financial aid, it would show in there. Okay. If there is no financial aid, then underneath in that same financial aid tab, Underneath the 2022 academic year, uh -huh. there's something that is called a, um, I believe it's called a New York State cost projection or something to that extent where it essentially tell you um, what the estimated costs are for that year. And okay. then it'll show you based upon whatever your EFC is as well. So, Again, how, how, okay. Go ahead. I was going to say, make sure you check that to do list to see if anything is open there. Because if right. it's open there, like okay. say the TAP application is still showing there or you have verification documentation that you have to submit in, that would prevent us from dispersing out any award to the student. So just make sure mm -hmm. everything's completed on there if you haven't already. Because when I speak to the guidance counselor at her school, she says that they receive lists mm -hmm. with students' name on the list stating that there's still something that needs to be done on mm -hmm. you know, the parents' behalf. But she said, my child's name hasn't you know, been on the list yet. But mm -hmm. how do I get to the um, student account that you just told me to look at? So you would log into the student's CUNY First account. Um, I don't know what their login would be. It would be whatever they would have created or whatever their uh, user. My child. Would be. Yes, your child. Okay. Um, so if your child knows their CUNY First login information, you could just have them log in and under the student section, there's a few sections. It would show academics and then the one underneath academics would be finances. And in that finance section, there's a little financial aid area which you can see uh, view award and all that okay. information. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, it seems like a lot of the questions are financial aid heavy. I'm gonna say any last questions for, for, for Dina or Dana uh, referring to uh, VCART or, or, or housing. If not, I guess we could just try to keep Michael around for a few more minutes, let them, we'll let them go so Dina could start working on those courses for everyone. Right, Tina. 
<laughs> Someone ask me a question. How are you? Are they just financial aid questions at this point? The question? Yes. Um, do you have anything to do with like a special ed or anything like that? Or they're like um, help around for people that go to college and they need just, you know. Yes, yes, yes. So we do have, and I, I you know, I, I mentioned this sometimes, I guess I didn't this week, I apologize. Um, we do have the Center for Student Accessibility. Their email address is pretty easy. It's CSA, oh, it's, there it is, Jesse's amazing. The CSA, CSA at csi.cun.edu. What a student would have to do is they would have to contact that office um, and they have like a little check-in with them. They, they are going to need uh, their documentation. So IEP uh, or medical documentation. Um, and you would register with the center and then they would help you and uh, give you any of the accommodations that the student would, would need or require. Accommodations are a little different when you're talking about high school accommodations as opposed to college accommodations, but there are still accommodations that a student can receive. Um, so yeah, because, yes, because, because everybody learns different, uh, you know, everyone has a different learning and, style. 100%. And it doesn't mean that person is stupid. It's just a different way of learning. No, 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 no. I just want to make sure that she or he can be involved in, in yes. the school and not be B U L L I E D. <laughs> no, no, no. That, what I, do you have? I, any I, policies on that too? Yes, of course. In fact, there's a, there's a student conduct piece in, in new student orientation. We also do a, a really big piece called civility and diversity, which is, is I think, maybe the most important thing we do in or, orientation. It's it, Jesse actually runs that session. She's amazing. That She's big on that. But it really is to teach students how to, because um, you're going to be in college courses, you're going to be disagreeing with, with fellow students, but how do you disagree in a civil way? Also, it's, it's going to talk about, you know, diversity. You're going to be in, in classes with people of all different, you know, and, and again, not just when we talk about race and religion, uh, but also learning styles, like you mentioned, right? To, how how to, 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 to get along in a diverse environment and how to, to be a, a, a really a good citizen on the campus. So that's something we definitely address in, in, in orientation, and it's really important. And anyone who is a mem who is, is registered with the center, that has nothing to do with their intelligence in any way, shape, or form. Everyone learns differently. Some people need accommodations. And, and, and you know, it also talks, that's the center also helps students with, with physical accommodations, right? We have a disability bus that, that, that's on campus. People who have mobility issues. Um, it can also be for students who have temporary disabilities. Right, you go out to catch that that pass, and you and you throw yourself down and break your arm, and you need somebody to help you take notes. So, there's lots of different um, accommodations. Register with the center. We actually have one of the one of the best, and I've been told this by people at other CUNYs too. We have one of the best centers for student accessibility within the city. So, contact them. They will need got documentation. Um, and again, and, and this has come up before, I agree with you, it'd probably be easier if we sent the emails to all of the parents. But what are we then saying then? Uh, you know, it's time for the, the students to take the driver's seat, right? They need to be checking their emails. We need to encourage them to check their emails. They also need to self-identify and self-advocate, right? So, so, you know, a student has any kind of accommodation that needs to be met. Um, it's not like in, in school where your IEP would be sent from middle school to high school and, and, and the teachers would then all know and meet, meet their accommodations. Students, when you come to college, need to self-identify. They need to self-advocate for themselves. Um, it's illegal for, for your high school to send us an IEP, right? We, you, you would have to send that to us and then, and then, you know, and then you have to chat with your professor. The professor is not going to have that information either. It's, it's all confidential. So even if you do check in with the center, the center is not going to contact all of your professors to tell them that you do have uh, this accommodation where you need extra time on an exam or need the exam read or you need a note taker. That's something the student's going to have to do. So I agree with you. And this all sort of is wrapped up into the question that was just asked. Uh, students need to check their emails. They need to, they need to start becoming um, adults, right? It, it's, it is a different, it is a change. Like I said in the beginning, it's different from 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 high school, right? And, and I'm, I'm, so th th that sort of answers the, both of those questions, I think, all rolled into one. I'm going to say last call for questions, last call. And I just have that email for that. For yes, it's, in, it's in the chat. Do you see it in the chat? CSA, uh, Jesse just put it in about two chats, two, two uh, submissions ago, Center for Student Accessibility, the email address is there, their, um, their, their web link. Thank you, Jesse. 
I have a, one last question, and this sure. one is for uh, Miss Dina Petelli. Oh, Dina, you're back. Um, so at this point, uh, my son has finished um, with his block, and he has um, reached out to you. And I think he's all settled with that. Um, so at this point, I guess we're waiting for June 3rd when we get the notification to um, register or join for the VNSO. Yeah, that's me. So right? he, I just want to confirm, he received a final schedule from us that has his block and any additional courses. Good. So yes, he's, he's registered. So now he, he moves over to Sean's area. Yes, he's done with his block. He has selected his classes um, and he had a question on timing for one, but um, I think you replied to him. Um, you can change that just that's the way they were programmed. So um, yeah, I think that is all taken care of. So at this point, the next step, I guess we're waiting for June 3rd. Yes, and he should he should receive it on June 3rd. Again, it, it, I'm not... You know, we didn't pull that list yet, but if he was, right. if he received his invite to VCART, he should be on that list that mm -hmm. I'm going to email on June 3rd, giving them the directions on how to complete VNSO. Right. Again, so, it's very similar to the, the directions that he received from VCART. For the VCART, right, correct. Well, um, I, I reached out more than he does because he's a typical boy, you know, very lazy. Um, but um, I do be on his back to check his email, like, you know, um, but as a first time parent of a, first time high school freshman. I don't know everything. So uh, I'm just reaching out just like the other parents, you know, so we don't miss anything because I'd hate for us to miss something. So this is what I say as, as with with me, you know, we do have FERPA, right? So if you contact me, I can't really give you all the information. But this is what I, I say you do. If you have questions throughout the process, have him email me. Say, hey, stand there. Hey, email Sean and copy you and, and ask those questions so you're a part of the conversation. As long as he does that, then you're, you're a part of the conversation and, and he's living with you, make him do it, right? Um, easier said than done, right? Um, it, it, listen, it is a transition. It's a transition not only for them, but for you. Yeah. It, it is difficult where, you know, it's not like high school where he didn't do his homework, teacher would pick up the phone and say, hey, um, he didn't do his homework last night, make sure he does it. It's, that's not going to happen. So right. we, we do need to get them, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a tough, tough adjustment for them, for you, for us, to get them to start to do these things. And, and maybe through this process, have him include you on these emails for now. As long as you do that, then I'm happy to share any yes. information. Yes. Well, I think we're, um, we're on track and um, we're just waiting for June 3rd at this point. Yes. And, and again, he has, again, it's an asynchronous course. He'll be able to go in, log in, watch those videos, take the courses. And, you know, normally when we do V uh, orientation in person, we don't allow parents to come, right? But now you're at home. Uh, there's no reason why he, maybe let him show you the videos, let him, you know, go through it with them. So you see the services, you know, a full idea of all the services that exist and, and, and the civility and diversity and all the different sessions we have. There's a nice, there's a nice one that, that Cass and Dina put together too on, on, on choosing your major and, 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 and the myths that are associated with, with choosing a major. Like, you know, I have to be a bio major to go to medical school. It's, it's, a, it's a great video they put together. So it's a good thing for you to watch too. So participate in that too while, while we're okay. online. All right. Well, thank you guys very much. I'm going to leave now. I'll reach out to Michael about the, um, the financial aid um email i will reach out to you um i'll let you know our information so you can tell us what the status is and stuff like that okay sounds good yeah and we there's can... my email address again email me if you have questions and my son has miss uh, dina's email so i think i'm all set thank you guys very much i appreciate it bye great so I, i'm gonna say that's the end unless anybody else has any questions but and i like i always say all at all my sessions the session is not over once I close out the Zoom, you have our contact information. Email me anytime. I'm here to answer questions. If it's if it's really you know uh, confidential information, copy your 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 per, your your student on the email, and then I'm happy to to share that information. As long as they're part of the conversation, I'm happy to share any conversation with any parent. As long as the student is involved, and again, it's important that they're involved because they're going to be the ones in the courses. So make sure that they're they're involved. I know it's I know it's tough it's tough getting them to to. To participate but they have to they're in charge now thank you all for coming thank you thank you thank you i hope to see a lot of your students in person soon thank you for joining us all of the links 
mentioned in this video are in the description below.